So welcome everyone and blessed Sabbath. It's a beautiful day here in Norway. The colors are just gorgeous on the trees. The sun is up and I have peace and joy in my heart. And I hope that you all have that. And it's so nice to see you, Jan, that uh, you are with us. Jan said that he probably could not be here today. So I'm extra happy to see you. I'm in a war zone, but I'm also happy that I have time to be here now. Amen. And Marilyn is there, and uh, I was just getting the message from uh, Perry that he said, I'm coming in a second or something like that. So, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so, um, today we are can going we please, to... Can we please pray for my sister and her husband who's going from her and uh, my six-year-old nephew, whom I just brought to a friend from school where he can stay the afternoon? because uh, he's in the middle of a divorce and it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's hard. It, it's hard, right. So is, she wants to leave him or? No, he's gone and he, he don't, don't even want to speak about it, why? It's like, he's like very going, at, at part, partly because I think he's, he wants to drink without, without censorship. Hmm. Yeah. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven. <clears throat> First, we want to praise you that um, we can meet here as a family and uh, know that you are rejoicing in heaven, that we want to ask you to bless this meeting and we know you, we, you will, Lord. And uh, we thank you that uh, you know the sorrows down here on this earth, how many people are suffering. I pray, Lord, that you will uh, encourage those who need encouragement and uh, speak to the conscience uh, of uh, the person who might be wrong, Lord. We know that you are the one who can heal, but you have to have us to co cooperate with you. I pray that you will encourage Jan, and I thank you so much that he's with us. And thank you for Marilyn, and that you will bless her and her family, and Perry and the work he's doing there in Honduras, and everyone who's joined here today, Lord. We, we praise you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, let's see. Perry hasn't come yet, so uh, but we can start in the way. I'm sure that he will soon uh, come. So, uh, yeah. Um, First, uh, the first verse is, let's see, what was it? Uh, uh, Romans, Romans, let me see. Uh, Romans 14, chapter 14 and verse 13. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So what are your first thoughts when you read that verse? My thoughts have to do with not judging those who have come to Christ and have asked for his spirit to renew them and cleanse them from sin. And then understanding that it's a process that they're going through and pray for them and support their process. But I also think that God has judged the world already through Christ as far as ungodliness and what sin is. And we have to, we live in a society that says, just live and let live and don't judge anything. And that's very confusing. <laughs> you know, that means mm. there's no right and wrong. So God wants us to have a sense of his righteousness and renew our conscience just just as Jan said that, is it your brother-in-law that's getting a divorce or your brother? In-law. Your brother. Yeah. My brother-in-law. Yeah. Your brother-in-law. He just, you know, we're not to judge that, but the behavior is rebellion. I want to drink. I want to do with my body what I like. It creates yeah. division. It creates sin and it creates harm. What do we do in the face of, Things that are sinful and harmful. Do we no not idea. judge? Do we not judge the things? They always say, love the sinner but hate the sin. So we have to be at that place where 
the sin has already been judged by God, not us. And we're just praying that they awaken to righteousness. The thing is, I, I, I was about the same age when my parents divorced, so I feel for my nephew. Oh. That is, it comes like extra close, you know, so that's like, uh, but uh, okay. yeah, but back to the, to the verse, because uh, what I also like underlined was the verse before that one, which says, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. So we have to judge ourselves and not point fingers at, at, as our neighbors or brethren or other people. So it is us and God we need to be clear with, you know. Uh, then I, I, can, uh, I can go better through the world. And then he says, let us not therefore judge one another anymore. Because, you know, you have to be right with God. So thinking, not thinking about judging, but yeah, yeah, maybe it's judging. Um, I have a neighbor who, uh, um, yeah, she says she loves Jesus and she probably does. And, but then she is uh, cursing and she's, uh, she's uh, you know, uh, using God's name in vain. And I don't know how to tackle that. How would you tackle that? Hello, Perry. Good to see you. Hello. Good morning. I'm on good my morning. phone. My something's wrong with my computer. It's not working. The, well, the, the link. No problem. No problem. Well, it's good to have you with us. And happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Thank you. So, what would you do, Perry, if uh, <clears throat> your neighbor, which you are, uh, you know, trying to do some Bible studies with, and she is cursing and using God's name in vain, and somehow, yeah, how would you tackle that? <laughs> oh boy, people here like to curse a lot, so um, uh, that's mm -hmm. a hard one. <laughs> I agree. It's a hard one because, again, we can't look at what's in their heart, how how they feel about one another, just because their language is colorful. But I think as a as a kindergarten teacher, when my little kindergartners use the they always say, oh, my God, and it's a very common phrase. It's not really cursing, but it's using his name in vain. There's one little boy that reminds them, and then I remind them, and we we keep trying to keep each other in check. So when we love Jesus, we keep each other in check. It's a loving reproof, like, oh, please don't say that. I, I, and my brother-in-law, who doesn't claim to be a Christian, was a leader, uh, was a boss in his job, and the man that worked for him was a Christian, and he kept hearing my brother-in-law cursing. And one day he just went to him and he said, will you please stop using God's name the way that you do? It really offends me. And Louis, the brother-in-law was shocked that it upset him because to him, it was just an adjective. It was just a colorful word. It didn't mean a thing. He just used it. It didn't represent his character or he didn't think it hurt anybody. And now he's hearing from this other Christian who's saying, please don't. And it got him thinking. It got him thinking about the, the power of his words. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, I have been thinking that I should, um, when the situation is, I don't know when the situation is uh, right, but uh, God has to tell me when I can say it that it really bothers me when you are using, you know, talking in that way. And uh, she will probably say, uh, because, you know, sometimes I'll be saying, oh, she's going to do that and that and that on the Sabbath. And I said, um, oh, no, not on the Sabbath. You know, somehow I'm trying to tell her not to do things on the Sabbath. I said, oh, I'm doing so many wrong things anyway. So how would you, oh. how would you tackle that? Jan. I was thinking when you talked about uh, that the Bible studies you're doing with her, I was thinking immediately of Roger Monroe, how he was led to Christ. 
that he was like smoking and uh, and drinking, cursing, whatever, doing. And this couple, this uh, married uh, Adventist couple, they took him in anyway and continued. And he was on fire for, for the Lord and for the Bible. And he learned and learned and developed, you know, a personal relation to the Lord. So at some point, you know, the Holy Spirit was, was persuading him. I, I think, you know, that, that is the thing like we, because when we start and we try to correct a habit or, a, or an, uh, an elfair, uh, what is it in English, elfair? Um, something you do. When you try to correct that, uh, sometimes it's it's it, it it it's not reaching the heart. You know, I think it's it's important anyway to pray together and to keep, continue study Bibles because that that is the way that is the to open the way. You know, for the spirit to 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 work and to move, and then there will there will come a, a hopefully a, a change of mind. I remember when I was studying, when I should become an Adventist, I was studying the Bible and uh, the pastor was uh, uh, reading from, I think it's Peter's, that women shouldn't use, you know, jewelry. And so, you know, in that, in that case, he was showing me this is wrong, right? So I remember I was, I wanted to screw out on my ears while I sat there, but I thought, well, I wait until I come back home. But anyway. So, but there must be a place where we can, you know, well, I'm sure, of course we should pray, but on the other hand that we correct, right? Well, you can study the topic like vain speech or something. There's a lot of advice in the Bible. So once you have a Bible study, you can just, you know, put some of these verses in, you know, put, put some of these contexts in and say, you know, the, the tongue is a is a, a, a little uh, rather on a ship, you know. It can steer the whole body. It's a fire, you know, burned from hell and so on. You know, all these things. Uh, Paul is speaking a lot also about, you know, vain vain speaking and and you know, like empty words. And so it's it's possible to to do a Bible study on it without without you know stamping personally on a person's foot. I don't know the 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 temper temper or character of of that person, you know, because also there you have to be. Uh, careful, because mm. we can we can say the right things and we can have all the truth, but if we apply it in a, in an unloving or in a way which we can think it's loving, but the person if the person does not perceive the love we have, it doesn't help. It makes things worse. Well, I thought I should go through the Ten Commandments with her. That's a good start. That's a good start. Yeah. Yeah, Regina. Good morning. Good morning. Um, uh, this is a very interesting conversation. And I, in my own personal life, am uh, going through a very similar thing with my husband. And what I realize in going through this experience is that it's actually a blessing to me. Um, it's helping me to refine my thoughts um, instead of dwelling on what the prob what problem um, my husband is going through. I correct my thoughts and um, focus more on um, the faith, uh, faithful thoughts that there's a lot of possibility that my husband can come from this experience knowing far more than what he could know with not going through the experience and, um, and having those hopeful and faithful thoughts only bring more healing towards his experience because I'm refusing to allow myself to dwell on the scary thoughts and the um, thoughts of no hope and faith. And I'm just keeping my mind focused on what God can do in his life. And sometimes God allows a person to sink very, very low to have a crushing experience. Uh, there's somewhere in scripture where it talks about how God works with a, uh, a life that is crushed um, and, and that we got to get to that point where um, uh, just everything uh, in our life has been crushed and then God um, 
um, remolds us. And I'm not quite sure. Well, there's the potter and the clay, and there's so many different um, things in scripture that refers to um, this condition that I'm talking about, uh, where a person sinks so very low. Um, and our responsibility is to have hope and faith for what God can do with that experience. Because when we begin to have doubt and, and we allow our minds to be filled with fear, then we are magnifying what Satan wants magnified. And we have got to um, be more faithful in what God can do in those situations, because we don't want to magnify what uh, Satan wants magnified, because our thoughts and our words and our actions, well, I should say our thoughts and our words um, eventually become actions, and they're powerful. They hold electromagnetic energy. And I know that sounds new agey, and I don't really uh, appreciate it when people think that those words sound new agey because it's a fact that God has made our thoughts and our words to hold magnetic energy and uh, quantum physicists have actually proven this and so when we become uh, more aware of how our thoughts and words hold magnetic energy we become it, it provides us, I should say, an opportunity to become more responsible with our thoughts and our words. So I hope that's helpful. Amen. Thank you. Wise words. Yeah, God, he spoke and it happened. And somehow that is creating words in what we are saying too, right? So, um, yeah. Any more thoughts? I have a thought. Um, it's also um, an opportunity for us to grow in more faith uh, towards God when we're trying to discipline our thoughts and our words. So uh, for my personal experience with my husband going through a very similar situation, as the brother mentioned, um, for his son-in-law or his brother-in-law, I mean, um, um, I'm no longer feeling like a victim. Um, I used to many years ago, but I feel like it's an opportunity um, that God is allowing me to go through this to refine my character and to bring me closer in relationship to him. And so when we change our perspective on this situation and, and, and stop seeing ourselves as a victim and see that, oh, I have an opportunity to grow more and more in a relationship with God, then it's not a burden like it once was. It's actually, um, we, we bring a different purpose to the experience. Um, we see it, we begin to see it as a blessing we begin to see that all things work together for good to those who love God. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I can also say that the people that we choose to be around have an influence on us. So as a mom, my 13-year-olds went down and stayed with their, my brother-in-law and his wife, and my oldest one, well, she was 13 at the time, came back cursing and with her ears pierced. I'd never cursed in front of her. I didn't want her to get her ears pierced, but they decided to take her into a place to get her ears pierced, and she was using the F word. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you talking to me like this? It was the influence. In very short time, like I had raised her 13 years under my wings, right? In a very short time of three weeks, she picks up all this, what I call sin, you know, the, against what I had raised her in. And my younger daughter, when she went down there, had a similar experience of just picking up 
the freedom of cursing is what I, I saw. She felt like, oh, this is interesting. It's fun using this colorful language. And at that age, they're fascinated with it too, because they didn't hear it in their own home. And now they're like, I'm cool. I can say all these words. I don't know. It's obviously, it's not cool when you understand that it represents something powerful and rebellious. So I, I, I think that we have to stand firm. And as Jan said, when we do correct someone or, or try to redirect, we need to do it lovingly. We need to see the heart. We need, you know, it's like, I still love my brother and sister-in-law, and they still think they're valuable and wonderful people. But I feel sad that so much of their life has not been looking to Jesus. But when we look to Jesus, just like the disciples did, they were changed. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So uh, I would like to ask you, Perry, uh, you are raised in a Christian home. And uh, um, I don't know if your father was strict, but uh, if he was, or uh, did you rebel against him? Uh, and so how did he treat that situation with you? Would you like to share? Maybe you did not rebel. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really didn't rebel. Um, four of us brothers, we... We didn't rebel in that in that sense or anything like that. Uh, we were raised in a very strict home and uh, in, a, in a pastor's home. And I remember a lot of times us as a family being around people and someone would curse. But just because my dad was there, they would part. They would say pardon or I'm sorry right away. So very few times I or or almost not at all. Did my dad have to say something because around here people curse a lot but everyone knows everyone and they kind of respect the fact that you're a pastor or a minister and as a pastor myself i've had similar similar experience so um i guess there will come up issues where i would have to say something especially if my little girls are close by but it hasn't happened yet but um we have to pray every day for tact and wisdom to say the right word in at the right time and in love, you know. People understand it around here, I think. Um, if they don't say I'm sorry before, because you know, they recognize you're a pastor and they they know they're doing something wrong. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, in school, we had a lot of a couple of guys that would curse a lot, and um, I never really picked it up, you know. Thank God. But yeah, the influence is strong. It, it, it is something cool and you spend a little time with them and you kind of feel like, wow, they're fun, you know, but you know, your conscience bothers you and you try to back up, <laughs> back off. <laughs> yeah, that was Amen. my experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So if we read the, the other part of this verse here, uh, that uh, no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Is there something, how do you, or how do you understand that verse? Or how, how do we, can we say something practically for not to do that? Or how, what could we do to uh, make our uh, brother, uh, you know, that he may do something wrong? Yeah, Regina. Our um, thoughts can even be a stumbling block towards others. If we get the impression that somebody is not going to change, that there's no hope for their condition and they will remain right where they are in their sinful life, then our thoughts uh, become a stumbling block for that person. Uh, we have to have faith and hope that change can happen. And the story I keep going back to in the Bible concerning this subject is Esther and how fabulous Esther was in her behavior, which was her thoughts manifesting itself in her behavior. 
um, she was married to a king that did not recognize her God. She was married to a king that was narcissistic. And um, that is a very, very difficult personality to be married to. And yet she was a living example to him um, of who and what her God was. And, um, but yet she pleased the king, but she didn't please the king in a way that compromised uh, what was right and wrong. And, um, and she was such a magnificent example that God even named a book in his Bible after her. And I think that that, um, is a very, very powerful book for all of us to really see ourselves and our daily struggles in this world with whoever it is, um, how we can show honor and respect um, to someone that maybe has not received honor and respect from many people. And once they're, um, for instance, the king that Esther was married to, he received fake honor and respect from people. And he knew it. He knew that his threats um, forced people into showing fake honor and respect to him. But when he was in the presence of Esther, he knew it was sincere honor and respect. And it caught his attention in a way that other people didn't have his attention. And we need to believe that we can have the same influence on people that are struggling with all these various different things. And we have to keep a faithful mindset that change will happen in their life. Otherwise, if we entertain the thoughts that there's no hope for their condition, we become part of their problem. Thank you, yeah. Regina. That's yeah. very, uh, also, I feel very affectionate also for the book of es Esther. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, witness. Uh, I was thinking about uh, brother Jan Hauk, uh, when you talked about uh, not to put a stumbling block into another's way. He was uh, he, he was make, doing a very interesting uh, practice uh, when they got married. He with his uh, Maria, um, uh, he he said that we are not kissing in public, we're not holding hands in public because this is something uh, we want to reserve for our private, intimate sphere at home. This is something between us personally, and also when when we uh, when we when we're in, kissing in public. We, we don't want to uh, put maybe uh, wrong thoughts in, in, in person's mind because we don't know how the person, how the people react, you know, in the streets or people we don't know and so on. So that they, they can, they have this kind of uh, uh, a kind of shame, you know, like uh, to be very, very uh, uh, conscious about how they as a married couple react in public. So they didn't even want to kiss at their wedding. Hmm. So I was thinking, you know, that, that, was, that was interesting. But very respectful in a way also. I Thank think you. that's taking it too far. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just saying, like yeah, there's a thing yeah. called natural affection that Ellen White says, you know, you should hug in front of your children and let them see how you love each other. We don't have to act so reserved that we that we're afraid to kiss because the world might take it the wrong way. You know, I think yeah, you know, it's it's going too far. <laughs> I, I do understand you as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very very nice to listen to Jim and Sally Homburger. You know, they are they're more or less I shouldn't say always holding hand, but they are so much. You know. Even when when they are doing things, uh, you know, with us, you know, they always not always, but sometimes give a little kiss before maybe the wife goes. Is Jim is going to have the program, and they're touching each other and holding hands, and I think it's beautiful. Yeah, 
They it's are healthy. so much on fire. Yeah. And children need to grow up in that kind of a warm home, mm -hmm. not something so cold and reserved, but where there is well, health. Affection. Well, they are not. They are. They are not. They are not uh, cold in the home. That is. That is not at all. I mean, they've visited us privately, and we saw them also. But they. They are talking about being outside in the public. You know, they. They are very loving per people uh, privately also. And but it's just that they, they, they made that decision. You know, and that is something they have to live with. Mm. So, uh, <clears throat> Perry. Mm -hmm. Do you have um, any thoughts? I was thinking also about um, being a cause of stumbling. Sometimes you have to take into consideration the culture of the people where we are. And perhaps that's the situation with this couple, I don't know. But um, that's also, sometimes for us, it's, it's not a problem, right? It, it, it's something good even. But in another culture, then it's, it would be offensive. And a cause for them to, well, the word there is to, to, to fall or to apostatize. So I guess you'll have to reevaluate whether it's really a moral issue because some people get upset at anything. <laughs> but so we do have to take culture into consideration. And in some cultures, I'm trying to think of a good example, but I know with, with traveling and being in different places, um, I, I try to ask or really catch on quick, what would be offensive in this, in this culture? And avoid that at all costs. Because once you offend someone, it's very hard to, to change that perception, you know, first impression type of thing. And, um, you know, it could be something simple, especially, I know well in the Philippines, respect to elders is very, very big, even here, but they're more so. And um, not, only, not only respect in words, they have a word that you have to use when you're speaking to an older person, but also the act of grabbing the person's hand and touching your forehead with it if the person is a certain age and older. Um, I always did it and people would really like that, you know, because they, they feel like you, you didn't offend them, you accepted them as they are. Maybe if I didn't do it, it wouldn't cause them to apostatize or, or fall morally, but uh, you don't want to give people even an occasion to, to begin to gossip or, or, or bicker or feel offended and have hate or anything in their heart. I guess it could apply, you know? So I was thinking yes. about the cultural things, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I Thank think when we, when, we look, when we look at the, at the context, the verses in, you know, also uh, Paul is speaking about like things offered to idols and different things, you know, it's just like, you know, things that idols are nothing, you know, but if your brother feels something like that and his conscience is hurt, you know, it's, it's like very, it's very sensitive in a way how he's writing. So I'm, 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 I'm I don't know, I read this chapter a few times also. I'm not really getting a fully understanding of it, I feel. You know, there's many things like I find a bit hard to understand as such, but, but you know, uh, I can live with that un until now. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, it's interesting, you know. The Lord will maybe, you know, enlighten me when, when the time is right. <laughs> Right. Yes. The, the I want to just say, oh, sorry. sorry, Perry. Go right ahead. I want to just say that I I feel that um, some of the leaders in our church overreact to the youth and they don't work with them. And that has been that could be a reason why my daughter is not an Adventist anymore. Um, she was at camp, Camp Winnikeg. We have a camp here and she was a counselor. And she was fooling around with another counselor as a joke. The two of them were standing there saying, man, this camp has all these silly rules and they call it code red and code purple when, when you see two people acting affectionate. And they were like, well, so what's wrong with a kiss anyway? And they grabbed each other. Now they're young and they're foolish, but they grabbed each other and, and they weren't really being romantic. But they they did that as a joke. And the way that the camp treated them was overreacting. So what I feel the camp should have done is had a meeting with these counselors and saying, you are role models. 
anyone catching wind of this behavior is going to also make fun of it, of our rules. And you're making fun of our rules. And that's not a good example. And we're going to warn you to not do that again. But instead, you know what they did? They treated it like a courtroom. And they brought in one, my, my daughter in first or second into a room with other leaders, um, the count, other counselors and the leader of the camp. And they sat down and they interrogated them. Like, what did you do? What did you say? What did she say? How was, where did you kiss on the lips, on the cheek? Tell us more about that. And they like, they like put a, put a microscope right up to it. And then they, they focused in on it and they turned it into the most horrendous crime. And then they said, we're going to suspend you without pay for a week for this. And they did the same to the other girl who came in and was treated like she was in a courtroom to see if their story lined up. It, it was overdone. It was crazy. My daughter came home. And from that moment on, I heard her say, this is why I don't like Adventism. They have so many stupid rules <laughs> and they don't, they don't treat me with love and understanding. Um, and I... I wrote them a letter and I said, you know, if we err, we need to err on the side of mercy, not judgment. If we throw judgment at people, we turn them off. If we throw mercy and correction at people, we draw them in. Of course. So yeah. this was a very, it sounds like a small incident, but I truly think it's one reason why my daughter is not in and Ma and her friend, neither one of them. I think the way they were treated by fellow Adventists made them feel judged and unwanted. And that is a big problem with our youth. Right. Yes, we have much to learn and learn and learn, as the Bible is saying. <laughs> yeah, Regina. Marilyn, that is a beautiful uh, example of what I was trying to explain about um, how we can magnify a problem and become part of the problem. Um, that is a perfect illustration. Uh, so thank you so much for that uh, story because uh, we need to all be very mindful of how easy it is to magnify the problem and get more of a problem. And where do we see Jesus behaving that way? We are to have the mind of Christ. To have the mind of Christ is to have his character. Mm -hmm. And where do we see Christ behaving like that? So true, so true. We don't. We have to learn. God has to put it into our hearts so that we can love with the love he has. Then we are prepared for heaven, he says. Right? So, um, well, let's move to, uh, let's see, uh, Romans uh, chapter, let me see here. Romans chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. If you would like to read that, Perry, please. Oh, Romans 16, 17, and 18. Very good. Romans 16, 17, and 18 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good works and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, thoughts, please. Are we causing divisions when we are talking about uh, how we believe that Jesus is the real Son of God? Um, personally, I don't think this applies in that sense. It says, mark them which cause divisions and offenses. Contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. Um, 
basically the doctrine they had learned in, in this is that we shouldn't cause divisions and, and offenses. I'm not, I don't think it's in the sense that uh, mark them which cause division contrary to a certain doctrine or something. Um, we know in the church, for example, if, if we're one body in a church, we cannot accept immortality of the soul or, or Sunday worship. So someone cannot just come and say, okay, I'm going to do this and I'll be a part of you. Well, you can visit us, but you can't, you know, you, you, you're not going to be a part of the body. Um, in that sense, there is a division. Doctrine does cause divide. Jesus says he's not come to bring peace, but a sword. Um, it doesn't mean that's the way our, we should act towards people, but the truth divides. That's clear. Now, divisions and offenses. So the context is a little bit more, not, not about naturally dividing, uh, not the natural dividing that the truth brings, but simply people who are divisive. And bring offensive uh, and bring offenses. Uh, you know, recently because I'm I'm trying to get up a little health center and I'm trying to now think and plan. Okay, what is going to be my strategy? How am I going to run this place? Yeah. So I'm studying the book Councils on Health. There's the the a large section, the whole middle of the book, over a hundred pages, is how to run a sanitarium, from the building to the paid. Everything is there. And so what I've been learning is that in, in a health center, in an Adventist health center, especially in a health institution, where guests come that are not Adventists, we should never bring up the peculiar points of our faith and contest and contend about it with the guests or among ourselves in front of them. This should never happen. But she says, our material, should be scattered almost everywhere for them to see. So instead of causing division and offenses with our words and actions, just put the stuff there. And if people want, they're gonna pick it up and read it. And they're gonna see us living it, worship, Sabbath keeping. They're gonna see our peculiar faith. We don't have to make it a point of discussion or push it down their throats. It causes division, it causes offenses. So I'm thinking one situation where this verse might apply. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, it reminds me like of John when he says, uh, we should not love with words, but with actions. Because hmm. then people will see our faith also. That is James then also. But uh, how to include one in that uh, setting? If you want someone to see you, you have to demonstrate something. How to include something in that you demonstrate? Did you understand the questions, brothers and sisters? A criminal need a witness. That's a... Was it was it a question? Sorry. Oh, I, I just to clear it, this up, but um, maybe I made it more difficult to understand. But uh, some say a criminal need a witness. Criminal so, need a witness? Yes. So, but, but if you understand what I'm saying, if, if you demonstrate something, you need something to see you. Yes, you, through but, your work. But, but, through, yeah. but uh, the question is, how do you include someone? in your demonstration we are his witnesses yeah but we are the, his witnesses so who are we and who are we i think uh, that we are witnesses by by following the light god has given us we are witnesses mm -hmm. you know we mm -hmm. don't even think about it right okay but uh, i just uh, this thought come up to me because if you if you only see Maybe that uh, that's uh, what this God has given you as a gift. You see with your eye, and uh, you can't say you can say you are, are not uh, use for you because I, I'm not a leg. But uh, so I understand what you're saying. But uh, maybe God wants more than just see. Maybe he wants. So if 
you just stand on that point. I have to demonstrate the law. I not have to, but if you demonstrate your law, so can others see. But who are we? Uh, isn't that the person that see also demonstrating his law? Are you are you aiming at that we are we are we are different parts but the same body? Like we have all different gifts and different responsibilities. Is that what I can understand from 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 you? That was coming up in my mind while I talk. Yes, yes, but that makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, me yeah. too. Any more thoughts on those verses? Yeah, I I find a, an interesting positive uh, dualism in a way in the, in the, in Philippians, uh, where Paul is like writing again about marking someone and about uh, and about their own belly. So, but it's like it's like positive in a way that now you have to mark you have to mark paul you know following christ following paul you have to mark him and the, the what they're teaching and then and we can just read it philippians 3 17 to 19. there's there's a kind of similar message in it you're so talking we, about serve their own belly yes uh, but, but also mark you know uh, here it says Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. So uh, in, in, the, in the first one, you have to mark them that cause division, you know, to avoid them. But mm -hmm. also you have to mark, uh, which is the positive uh, 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 interpretation of this. You have to mark those that don't cause division. You, have to, you know, you have to mark those that, that walk in the, in, the, in, the, in the right doctrine. Um, and then it, it continues for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Mm. Again, you know, their God is their belly. And he said here in, uh, in, in, in Rome, in, in chapter 16, verse 18. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speech deceive the hearts of the simple. So it's again, it's, and this is, it has a very clear connection to 1314 again. That was the one I started wrongfully reading in the first time. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. So he's basically talking about two classes of people hmm. who are in the church. Uh, and then again, the ones they, they, they walk in the spirit and the ones that walk, they are carnal minded. Right. And I'm not saying I'm not saying it's a static uh, group, you know, because as long as we're not sealed, we can slide easily between these parts, these groups in different situations. At least that is the unfortunate experience I have. <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, in the spirit of prophecy, we find a lot of uh, quotes concerning this, you know, the mind body connection. Mm. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing now, but she mentions how a lot of times in the church, division and contention mm. began at the table, you know, so how people eat their, their god is their belly paul says in both instances if people are intemperate uh, it seems like it affects it affects our re it does affect our reasoning yes. and it um you know she speaks about the dyspeptic you know the dyspeptic he's um he's he's rash and he's boisterous and um, likes to uh, you know argue and fight. what is a dyspeptic what is that when she speaks yeah. about dyspeptic, someone who, um, because of their wrong habits of eating and drinking, have a have a digestive issue, whether it be lots of heartburn or gas, or in other words, when the stomach is not right, it affects our emotions, and so mm -hmm. we should watch what we eat that our emotions are not effect, uh, affected. I had something similar, an experience similar. Um, 
I drank some contaminated water recently, and I think that was the result. I, I got a H. pylori bacteria. Mm. And I noticed that along with trying to get rid of it and, and having it, and with the whole issues that I was having, I was having also emotional disturbances like anxiety in the night and, mm. and stuff like that, you know, anxiety and like a bit of panic or something. And then, you know, so it does affect your emotions when the gut is not working right, you know. Mm. And um, I'm, I'm feeling much better now, praise the Lord. Mm. Uh, guava leaves and aloe vera, just saying. <laughs> but anyway, oh, we need mm -hmm. to we need to watch what we eat. And mm -hmm. Paul makes this connection here. Contention, division, mm -hmm. whose God is their belly. And very interesting to me, the, the health aspect or the you know, connection yes, there. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Um, <clears throat> I remember we had um, uh, a worker. She was working at the health center in Norway where I uh, was working for 10 years. And she had stopped working there at that time when she had this experience, but she got uh, uh, ear infection and she wanted to treat it in a natural way. And she had, you know, really not learned how to do it. So anyway, she, um, the doctor told her, you have to go on antibiotica. And she didn't want to do that. So the infection went to her eyes. So the eyes became like tomatoes. And mm -hmm. then it gave, did something to her heart. So her heart, something in her heart crashed the red blood cells. So she had to have a blood transfusion. I don't remember anymore if it was every second week or, but she wanted to have vegan blood. She didn't want to have blood from, you know, someone who was eating meat. So when I was visiting her in hospital, I asked her, do you feel any difference when you get different blood? And she said, oh, yeah, when I have vegan blood, I'm so calm. But if I, I can sense at once if I get something else, I get irritated. Or, you know, she could really feel that something happened happen to her. So I thought that was very interesting. I was, uh, that's right, because I was at Burger King and I bought a burger. I was, uh, I was, uh, I was uh, aggressive, not uh, not after I eat, but before. So should I eat this? <laughs> uh, I was very aggressive, but I ate it. But, uh, and you can see on children too. If they get sugar, I have a friend, they live in Ondal's nest, and the children were small, they were quiet in the car until they came to a certain town, and there the mother and father bought ice cream for them, and afterwards they started to fight, and you know, this, uh, so the sugar thing is also um, really affecting our mind and behavior, and yeah. Regina, please. Uh this is a very interesting conversation in connection with uh, the original conversation that we had because, yes, the digestive tract is uh, referred to in the world of natural medicine as the second brain. Um, what we um, are digesting absolutely affects our emotions and our thought process. and. Um, the casein in milk it connected to or digested or trying to be digested with uh, the gluten in grains um, is a horrible uh, combination uh, that will really irritate um, the central nervous system. And so uh, Ellen White was so wise in her counsel to stay away from dairy uh, because um, dairy is a poison these days. Um, it is not what people imagine it to be. Um, and we've been brainwashed into thinking that all these foods uh, um, like milk are a healthy um, thing. I do consume raw, unpasteurized, unadulterated um, goat's milk. I actually had goat kefir last night and it was raw, 
goat milk that saved my life as a baby. And I went off of raw goat milk for many years because I could not find a reliable source for it. But I now have a reliable source again because the animal has to be raised the right way. It cannot be pinned up and treated in an inhumane way. Otherwise, that animal is going to have stress hormones connected to its milk. And um, when I went off of uh, raw goat's milk for many years, I felt it in my body. I felt I was not strong enough are are as strong as I once was. And and God even labeled the land of promise, the land of milk and honey. So when we have raw, unadulterated goat's milk, or which is the most identical milk to human uh, breast milk, Um, is a very healing substance. And it's one of the reasons why Barbara O'Neill's health retreats uh, were shut down is because she was recommending, she doesn't recommend it for adults, but she does recommend it for babies. And um, it's illegal for anybody to recommend uh, raw milk anywhere around the world. And there's an economic reason why they have made raw milk such a um, illegal substance around the world. And it's because the poorest people in the world were consuming goat's milk all around the world. How do you get poor people to work in your diamond mines, your oil fields, your coal um, mines? all these horrible, horrible um, jobs uh, where they're treated like slaves. How do you get them to even work in those jobs if they can stay at home and live uh, with their family and not be starving because they're getting so much abundant nourishment from something that free ranges like a goat? uh, how do you enslave that person? Well, you have to take away their the source of their food. And so um, raw milk is illegal around the world. And that's um, one reason it has become illegal around the world. Uh, but I think Ellen White was very wise in her counsel to stay away from dairy. And I believe, and this is only an assumption, I have no proof of this, but I believe when the corporate Seventh-day Adventist church looked at her recommendation um, to drink raw milk from a free ranged animal like a goat, um, because my, a Seventh-day Adventist great-grandma, and I'm 67, so um, my great-grandma uh, lived at the time that Ellen G. White was here uh, on this earth. She knew the recommendations of Ellen G. White, and my great-grandma knew uh, when my mother stopped breastfeeding me at a week and a half old, um, that, that was the perfect substance to keep me alive. And I have far stronger teeth and bones than any of my breastfed siblings. And when my mother uh, learned the benefits of drinking raw goat's milk, she said, that's why your teeth and your bones are so strong. She said, I just didn't understand why you did not have um, rotten teeth and uh, why your bones were so strong when you were younger because you were so hard on your your teeth and your bones. It didn't make sense why your teeth and bones were so much stronger than your siblings when I didn't breastfeed you past a week and a half. So there's all these things that have taught me over the years that uh, raw goat's milk is a fabulous substance. The people that I buy my raw goat's milk from, they have to go to Washington, D.C. and legislate every few months to keep their business open and legal. And most people will not go through all the things that this company has to go through to keep their business 
up and running um, legally. And so anyway, I just wanted to share that, that testimony because we are chemical beings, electromagnetic chemical beings. That means every mineral in our body holds an electromagnetic charge and it's a combination of those minerals and substances that gives us our energy and gives us a, a very peaceful uh, spiritual feeling um, because chemically we're balanced and we don't have that when we just put whatever we want into our bodies. And so we can be the living example that um, God intended us to be when we are very strict with what we will put into our body. Oh, getting back to the uh, Seventh-day Adventist church, um, I believe that they came to a point where they realized that their uh, prophet, Ellen G. White, had said um, no um, pasteurized milk and uh, only consume uh, raw milk. I think they had to legally remove her mention of raw milk as being something to consume. Um, that's my own personal uh, thought on it. I have no evidence that that ever happened, but it makes sense to me from a legal standpoint that they couldn't have a, um, a messenger of God say that raw milk was a good thing, even though scripture still tells us that the land of milk and honey was where good health abounds. And so, uh, and that was not pasteurized milk nor was it heated up honey, because once you heat up honey, it becomes chemically the same as white sugar. So we have got to only consume uh, raw honey and raw milk. And the two together, and the two together are a fabulous dessert and very, very nutritious when put together. Thank you so much for sharing, Regina. So, Perry, you can maybe have goats there in Honduras. Sorry, goats? Yeah, you can probably have goats on your property in Honduras, right? I need some to keep the bush down. <laughs> but right. I, don't, I don't have any. <laughs> right. Well, um, any closing thoughts, brothers and sisters? I think... Um, Many thoughts, good thoughts, has been sharing with each other. Yeah, Marilyn's hand is raising here. Just that, and um, let nothing be done through vain glory. Where was that? Here it is. Philippians 2, 3. I think that's like the key to the motivations that we have to share the gospel, to share God's love to promote good things that God has shown us. It's let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Uh -huh. I, I think that's a wonderful motivation. Uh -huh. Amen. Good thoughts. Yeah, do you remember... Uh... Uh, Marilyn, that uh, Jan, he had a wish uh, last uh, Sabbath. Oh, he wanted the apple picking. So. Yeah. <laughs> Our so. school is going apple picking on Tuesday, too. Oh. All right. <laughs> if you yeah. have time, do you have time? Sure. Okay. Next, that's first and oh. half an hour. <laughs> So Regina, I saw your hand. Was there something you wanted to mention before the song? No, she was just giving a thumbs up. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. Ooh. All right. <clears throat> hey ho, you feel so fine running out across the field in a bright sunshine. Hey ho, you feel so free, standing at the top of an apple tree. 
Up in the morning before the sun. Don't get home until the day is done. Pick sacks heavy in my shoulder sore, but I'll come back tomorrow and pick some more. Hey ho, you feel so fine running out across the orchard in the bright sunshine. Hey ho, you feel so free standing in the top of an apple tree. A three-legged ladder stable, can you tell? Reaching for an apple and I almost fell. Got a 20-pound sack hanging around my neck and there's two more apples that I can't quite get. Hey ho, you feel so fine running out across the orchard in the bright sunshine. Hey ho, you feel so free standing in the top of an apple tree. Well, they come in green and yellow and red. You can eat them in the morning and before you go to bed. Play catch with them when you throw them up high. Whoop, squish, apple pie. Now we changed it to, they come in green and yellow and red. You can eat them in the morning and before you go to bed. Play catch with them when you give them a toss. Whoop, squish, applesauce. <laughs> hey ho, you feel so fine when you're running in a field in the bright sunshine. Hey ho, you feel so free. Standing in the top of an apple tree. Hey ho, you feel so funny when you're down in a town and you got no money. Hey ho, you feel so free when you're standing in the top of an apple tree. Hey ho, you lose your mind if you sing this song about a hundred times. Hey ho, you feel so free. Standing in the top of an apple tree. <laughs> I'd like to translate that for my nephew in German. <laughs> ah, good luck. <laughs> Thank you. It has to rhyme. <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah, well, we'll find out. I'll let you know if I succeed. <laughs> okay. That sounds good. My children at school want to hear it again and again. And then I, I do it. That's why I said you lose your mind if you sing it a hundred times. But they want me to do like the slow, like they come in green and yellow and red. Eat them in the morning and before you go to bed. Play catch with them if you throw them up high. Ooh, squish apple pie. And then I go faster and faster. And now can you do it? They come in green and yellow and red. You can eat them in the morning before you go to bed. You can play catch with them and throw them up high. Ooh, squish apple pie. So they, they just love that part. <laughs> So sure. Uh. Oh, you are making so many people happy, Marilyn. God is using you. Put a smile on over their faces, right? Yeah. Hope so. so. Yes. So. Yes. So, um, yeah, Werner, I can see you there. Maybe you could like to have a closing prayer, please. Sure. And just a thought. You all have been in how we approach those who are committing an offense before God, maybe little or large, that we truly must recognize that we ourselves still offend also in ways we do not even know yet we see dimly we see it not completely that we are tolerant with those who are in their mind innocently offend god but that we do give the free choice that we do help them to walk after god's conscience and then we can retain a friendship and we must retain a love for those people who do often or we think we need to correct. Yes, so let's pray. 
Father in heaven, we are so grateful that you have not given up on each one of us. You keep loving us. Help us to love also those who do not do as I think they should. But Father, help us to unite in the principle of working together, of drawing together in your word, in your spirit, in your love. And help us to understand that you have many people out there who have not bowed their knee to the dark powers, mm -hmm. but that you truly lift all of us up and help us to recognize the we are sliding in and out of choosing the right side or the wrong side. We thank you for that and thank you now that you give us that wisdom this week who is coming to deal with those people close to us. And we thank you for that you do for us. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.